Okay, brilliant. So welcome to today's webinar, Tipping Positive Change to Avoid Climate Tipping Points, which will be presented by Tim Lenton, Director of the Global Systems Institute and Chair of Climate Change and Earth System Science at the University of Exeter. So Tim has over 20 years of research experience in studying the Earth as a system and developing models to understand its behaviour. He's particularly interested in how life has reshaped the planet in the past and what lessons we can draw from this as we proceed to reshape the planet now. So during today's webinar, Tim will summarise recent evidence regarding climate tipping points, which support declarations that we are in a state of climate emergency. So he will share his latest results, identifying a human climate niche and discuss positive social tipping points that will need to be triggered in order to limit global warming to well below two degrees C. So as always, there'll be a chance for you to ask questions at any point during this presentation. So please do submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You should be able to see that now. And I will ask these on your behalf later on. So thank you all for logging in. And Tim, I'll now hand over to you. Thanks, Rihanna. Thanks for joining the webinar, everybody. I'm going to indeed talk about how we need to tip positive change to avoid uh, what we might call bad climate tipping points. So the overarching spirit of the talk is how we can use our, our understanding of complex systems to inform action to tackle the climate emergency. Now I'm going to start with a bit of a deep historical context just to get us orientated. So this is the last 650,000 years as recorded in the ice of Antarctica. It's in blue the carbon dioxide level going up and down and then temperature going up and down through what we call the glacial interglacial cycles a series of ice ages every, repeating every 100,000 years or so and you notice how closely tied carbon dioxide and temperature are uh, this in itself uh, even absent human activities this signal of an oscillating system if you were an electrical engineer or possibly a cardiologist you'd recognize that this wasn't a super stable system, earth system as we call it in, the, in my area of science. Um, this is a system where at the end of an ice age the earth's climate is quite unstable and is probably undergoing what I'm going to call tipping point changes that cause the abrupt exit from each ice age. So it's against the backdrop of a not particularly stable climate that we push the CO2 level up to over 400 parts per million now and uh, heading for about 600 parts per million mid-century which uh, it also is roughly where we're heading with the so-called nationally determining contributions of the world's nations to fail to meet the Paris Agreement. Uh, so we're heading to at least three degrees of warming and what I've been interested in for over a decade is what tipping points in the climate system uh, that might cause us to pass. So I'll say more about that in a minute. But I've also been working recently on how uh, intolerable even three degrees of warming will be for, for the global human population because it translates for the average person on the planet living on the land surface with population growth bias to the tropics translates to about an average seven degrees of warming for the average person. So I won't say much more about this recent work that we published in about Easter time, but uh, suffice to say, we've been uh, mapping out the fact that humans, just like any animal, have a preferred climate niche, a preferred range of temperatures and rainfall at which population density peaks and then it tails off it's at the high temperatures and the low temperatures but of course we're pushing the planet's temperature up and one of the most shocking things we discovered was uh, illustrated here that in a three degree warmer world we cause a large expansion of areas where the mean annual temperature is 29 degrees c or more it goes from the black spots today to the large gray shaded areas in a three degree warmer world and this is going to put around more than 3 billion people across the Indian subcontinent, Sub-Saharan Africa, and some of the other areas shaded out into unprecedented climate conditions, which would include 
pretty intolerable heat waves. And I suspect it would translate for those that have the means into many of them choosing to move elsewhere. So I won't say more about this study, but it should frame a, a recognition that we're heading into a dangerous climate territory for, for us just in a physiological terms as a species and major, I think, social reorganization, if not disruption, as, as hundreds of millions of people will be feeling compelled to move. I'll start my focus though and zoom in on these climate tipping points. What are they? What do we know about them? How close are they in temperature terms? And then I'll try and flip the narrative around and, and illustrate that we need to think in this non-linear way. We need to think in terms of tipping points if we want to have any hope of propelling the rates of change we're going to need to avoid um, the worst of climate change, to avoid uh, that those levels of warming that trigger those levels of human migration and to avoid the bad tipping, tipping points. We need kind of simple terms, good tipping points to happen in our social systems. And they need to be deliberately triggered, I think, by those who have the agency to do so. So I'll start with this little movie. This is my cartoon illustration of a system that, like many parts of the climate and other complex systems, has two different stable states, but it starts in one of them. And the system is being forced such that this, where the state it started in is losing stability as we watch now. And then it tips on my computer just then in, into the other alternative stable state. That's a kind of generic example of a tipping point. I'll, I'll go backwards and run it one more time. But the key ideas are that many complex systems exhibit what we call alternative stable states. Um, the stability of those states can be affected by what we loosely call forcing. In this case, let's think of it as global climate change. And that sometimes under particular conditions, we have a strong sensitivity where a small nudge there can tip a system from one state to another. Uh, and that can be quite difficult to reverse. We often say it's irreversible. Um, and it, as you saw, it can be quite abrupt. Now, this kind of behavior is true for a whole range of things, which I'd kind of crudely summarize here on axes of space and time. So it's true for parts of the Earth's climate system on all sorts of timescales, which I think I've colored in yellowy gold here. It's true for different types of ecological systems, uh, aquatic in blue or terrestrial in green, or things at the interface of the land and the ocean in, in a kind of gray color. And it's true for our social systems as well, which are colored in red. And these are just some of the examples I've pulled out from the rich literature on tipping points in complex systems. And I'll concentrate first on the tipping points we need to be most worried about in the climate. And then we'll switch to how the fact that tipping points manifestly can happen in social systems might be our salvation here. So if we start on the climate, uh, without getting too stuck in the gory details, it's important to know that our planet absent human activities, as I said, wasn't particularly climatically stable anyway. I showed you the ice age cycles to start with, but this is looking within one ice age, the last ice age, and seeing that there were repeated abrupt climate change events during the last ice age. At least 20 of these abrupt warming events as they're pictured here, recorded in the Greenland ice core, where the climate can warm of the order of 10 degrees centigrade in of the order of a decade. So that's pretty rapid and, and uh, climate change. Now we like to comfort ourselves that since we came out of the last ice age, the climate of what we call the Ho Holocene, the last 10,000 years interglacial is, is somewhat more stable. I'll just zoom in on the exit from the last ice age in the last 10,000 years there. But if we were to look in more detail, we'd see here that even during the somewhat more stable interglacial, the Holocene, there are some very abrupt tipping point shifts in the water cycle in the tropics of the planet that have been clearly linked to the rise or fall of past civilizations. And it's against that backdrop that we're doing this extraordinary planetary experiment of uh, 
pushing carbon dioxide and temperature levels up. And over 10 years ago, we were able to pull out this map of the candidate, what I call tipping elements in the climate system, the subsystems, if you like, of the whole climate system that could be tipped into an alternative state by our activities uh, this century. In fact, one of them was something that's already happened, the Antarctic ozone hole, uh, linked to not just the release of CFCs, but the fact that there is what we call scientifically strong nonlinear interactions between the formation of ice clouds in that high atmosphere over Antarctica and the chemistry that happens on the surface of the ice particles of those clouds involving the chlorine, fluorine or bromine from human produced molecules. That was a classic example of a tipping point we've already triggered and we're desperately trying to repair slowly. Everything else on the map is things we could uh, tip this century. Now the key question then becomes, well, okay, what, how likely are those different tipping events and how bad would they be? What would their impact be? So a classic risk assessment is simply to consider the combination of the likelihood and the, of an event and its impact. And this was 10 years ago, this was my crude assessment of uh, the risks that some of these different climate tipping points pose. I would change the, uh, the, the matrix or the map a little bit now, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we've been working hard on getting a handle on the likelihood of these events. Frankly, there's been very little fun to the impact of these events, but most of us intuitively think they're pretty, be pretty damaging. And we'll come back to that. So to give a concrete, like more parochial example of what a climate tipping point could mean in uh, our nation, assuming most of uh, you in the, on the webinar are here in the UK with me, um, and a canonical example of a climate tipping element is this thing that scientists call the overturning circulation of the Atlantic Ocean, which comprises a warm water current flowing northwards at the surface of the Atlantic, and then the formation of cold, what we call deep waters, either side of Greenland, where the water sinks from the surface of the ocean right to the bottom, and then there's a return flow of that cold water southwards along the bottom of the Atlantic, if you like, and it all loops back and connects back in the Southern Ocean to make a gigantic conveyor belt or ocean. Well, this thing is known to have different stable states, and in fact, switches between those states of what is implicated in those past abrupt climate changes I showed you in the last ice age. We've just been doing some work where you ask a simple question, uh, what if that overturning circulation were to collapse uh, in the near future? Um, what would it mean, for example, for not just the climate of the UK, but land use in the UK as, a, as one example of many we could choose? So what we show on the right here is we're coupling our climate model simulation where we can force the, um, this Atlantic overturning circulation to collapse, the so-called AMOC to collapse. We combine that with a sophisticated model of land use and land use decisions in the UK, which determine whether we basically farmers, while we here do arable farming in brown or uh, raise livestock on grasslands in green in the UK. So over the map of the UK on the on the left here, if you can see my uh, uh, cursor, that's pretty much how it looks today. Uh, under climate change with no climate tipping point, we expect anyway that arable farming will move northwards and westwards across the UK and it will become less favorable in East Anglia where droughts make it difficult to grow wheat there and such like. But if there's a climate tipping point, so we go down to a case uh, third map down here. Well, two profound things happen. It gets quite a bit colder in the UK and more seasonal, but crucially, it gets a lot drier here. And that essentially uh, eliminates arable farming from the UK. And then we looked at whether irrigating the UK could possibly, or its farmlands could possibly recover arable production. And whilst it looks like it could in the bottom map, we then calculated that the amount of water you need would far exceed how much it had rained in the winter. 
uh, how much you would need in the growing season in the summer. And therefore, you would have to start piping water across the UK like a giant pipeline under HS2 from the Lake District, where it's still raining, down to East Anglia. We calculated the cost of that. And not surprisingly, it's astronomical and it wouldn't make any economic sense to do that. So that just gives you hopefully a little taster of, of one parochial example of how a tipping point would affect us in our nation. We want to look, let's take a step back, let's look at the bigger picture. Let's ask how likely are these events? Well, 10 years ago, a bunch of experts were brought together to make an assessment of the likelihood of five different tipping points, collapsing the Atlantic circulation, losing the Greenland ice sheet, losing the West Antarctic ice sheet, triggering a dieback of the Amazon rainforest, triggering a change in the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And when all their complicated assessment information was pulled together, even then it was clear that if we carried on business as usual and we had to a four degree warmer world, then climate tipping points are more likely than not in simple language. And that's important because economists have persisted in assuming that these, whilst these are high impact events, that they were very low probability. Economists like to assume they were a little, and down at the sort of 0.1% probability level, not the more than 50% probability. More recently, colleagues have looked in the state of the art climate models that go into the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's assessment reports. And uh, the simple message that comes out of looking in the climate models is they show lots of abrupt shifts in different systems and different bits of the planet. And uh, quite surprisingly, a load of those abrupt shifts are clustered at about one and a half to two degrees of warming above pre-industrial, uh, somewhere where we're heading pretty soon. Now, why that is, maybe ask me a question later and I'll speculate on it. The reason we're not seeing lots of abrupt shifts at higher levels of warming in this plot is because there aren't many scenarios that go to higher levels of warming. So were there, there'd be a lot more abrupt shifts there as well. But still this weird peak at one and a half to two degrees is real when you correct for that. So that should cause us some concern because we're busy aiming for a Paris climate target of limiting warming to well below two degrees. By, and the very best we can hope for is one and a half degrees. And we would still be in the danger zone on this assessment. So I tried to summarize that uh, late last year in this sort of summary plot of what the IPCC itself thinks is the likelihood of tipping points and how that assessment has changed over time, moving downwards for successive IPCC reports. And the simple message here is uh, the more we learn, the more alarmed we should be because the closer to the present temperature, uh, the tipping points appear to be. Um, so we're already, I think, in the danger zone at 1.1 degrees of global warming this year. And uh, in fact, we've, we'll see in a minute that we have evidence that we can't rule out we've passed tipping points in, uh, green, in parts of Antarctica, at least, for the irreversible loss of major parts of the ice sheet. So that's what I tried to show on a map here, is a little crude summary of some of the evidence that's come in, particularly evidence we've gathered in the last 10 years, to, that suggests that what I'd identified a decade ago as key tipping elements are undergoing accelerating change. And that's true from the Amazon rainforest to that Atlantic overturning circulation I talked about and to the ice sheets. Um, and with respect to those Antarctic ice sheets, it's in West Antarctica where the physics we see of ice sheet retreat is consistent with a tipping point having been passed that will, is draining an area of that ice sheet that will contribute about 1.3 meters to global sea level rise and probably will destabilize the rest of that West Antarctic ice sheet and ultimately give us about three meters, three and a half. There's a part of East Antarctica showing the same signs of physical breakdown, and drains a further three or four meters of global sea level rise. And in Greenland, it's hard to rule out that we might not already be in an irreversible loss of the Greenland ice sheet, which totals seven meters of sea level rise. The only saving grace is that these ice sheet collapses, if that's what they are, are happening relatively slowly at the moment. So 
My personal view is we may already be committed to more than 10 meters of sea level rise in the long run, but here in the long run means a millennial time scale. Unfortunately, though, the more we warm things up, the faster the ice goes, so the faster those 10 meters of sea level rise could arrive. So that's pretty sobering stuff, right? Everybody should be aware of that. And um, the, on top of that, uh, I'm afraid we have evidence that these tipping points or tipping elements that are changing rapidly are causally interconnected. In other words, changes in one thing affects changes in another thing, and not always in a good way. So I hope you're well aware that the Arctic sea ice is in an unprecedented accelerating retreat. This is warming the whole Arctic region. That's one of the things that's contributing to the melt of the Greenland ice sheet accelerating. Then the fresh water that pours off the Greenland ice sheet is measurably contributing to the weakening of the Atlantic overturning circulation. And as that weakens and transports less heat from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere, that can contribute to warming things up in the southern hemisphere and warming up and destabilizing the Antarctic ice sheet, western East Antarctica. It is also known to be coupled to the monsoons in South America and around the planet in India. So um, we have to, we are working on whether we're looking at a situation where there's a so-called tipping cascade, where you tip one part of the climate and then it triggers the tipping of another and so on. Um, if you want a comforting thought there, well, <laughs> there aren't many, but um, the Earth system can't be so unstable that it's riddled with tipping cascades, otherwise we wouldn't be here to talk about it. But there is worrying evidence that, that these causal interactions are in the, going in a bad way, in a way we don't want them to go. So that's why some of us published um, back in summer 2018 a paper uh, alerting the world to the possibility that, you know, we might trigger a tipping point cascade and it would have basically amount to a global tipping point where you push climate change to a certain point through our collective activities and then you can't back out uh, because the system is propelling itself into a different climate state. And we've all got a vested interest in avoiding that outcome. So how do we avoid it or what should we be doing? Um, it's pretty obvious, I hope, to everybody that what we should be doing, but just to make a point, um, we put tipping points into a classic economic analysis of climate change, where economists believe that the price of climate damages goes up non-linearly with global warming, fair enough, uh, that, but they also assume that it costs more and more to hold the temperature lower and lower. So they then just do a simple optimization and tell us, in the case of Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, Bill Nordhaus, that the best place to be would be a three degree warmer world. Well, I think he's profoundly wrong, and that would be deeply dangerous. But to try and make the point, what I did with colleagues was uh, add some climate tipping points to the to the model that Nordhaus developed, which he calls DICE. Um, so I just have to, to do this, we have to specify some things about these climate tipping points I've been talking about. And uh, without boring you with all the gory detail, we need to put in their likelihood. And we get that from the study I showed you earlier that's 10 years out of date and is probably underestimating the likelihood, which is called the hazard rate here. We put in some scientific information about how long it takes to collapse an ice sheet or the Atlantic Ocean circulation or the Amazon rainforest. And then we um, lick our finger and stick it in the air to make a guess at what the damage is to global um, GDP would be uh, from any of these events happening. Nobody knows what that number is, but I would argue as I choosing a number like I have, like a 10% effect on GDP from uh, losing the Greenland ice sheet and ultimately getting seven meters of sea level rise, I'd argue that's a pretty conservative or low estimate of the damages. We put all those tipping points in Nordhaus's model and it completely changes the result as hopefully your intuition would suggest it should. So in green is what his standard model does, and in black with a very shaded area is how the outcome of the model changes when you account for tipping points. So if we look at the green line, basically his model doesn't say do nothing about climate change. It says do something in the top right hand corner, do something to control emissions, ramp up that effort over the century, um, and have a corresponding price on carbon emissions to try and achieve that. 
but still he has the temperature drifting up to 2.83 degrees or so of warming. As soon as you account for tipping points, the decision maker that lives in this model world totally changes their, their behavior. They say, oh, oh, this is big trouble coming. We need to shut down more than half of fossil fuel burning today and, and get rid of it altogether by 2050. And that essentially is why in the black we show a totally different result from the model, which is about an eightfold higher price on carbon emissions today, ramping up over time to force this uh, transition away from burning fossil fuels. And that is that in this model world can achieve limiting warming to well below two degrees above pre-industrial to around one and a half degrees, in fact. I have to say it's rather too easy to achieve that in this model, so there could be some problems there. But the, that message that uh, if we're to avoid the bad tipping points, we need to shut down fossil fuel burning by 2050, that's totally consistent with our government's own net zero report and our national legally binding target now to, shut, to eliminate all greenhouse gas emissions in the UK in the next 30 years, in other words, in one generation. So to follow the red line in this plot of emissions over time. And that brings me to my kind of message of hope, if there is one, because trying to shut down global fossil fuel burning and totally transform the energy economy and do lots of other things at the same time within one generation is never going to happen without some tipping points in social systems uh, propelling change at an accelerating rate. So that's how we've got to conceive of what we need to do. And there is room for hope because we see examples where tipping points are already happening in social systems to accelerate action and recognition on the climate problem. So we've got Greta starting as one person on strike outside um, her parliament. But for each person who changes their publicly stated preference on the importance of this issue, it becomes, when Greta protests, it becomes incrementally easier for the next person to join her. So sooner or later, she was joined by several of her friends and schoolmates and others. Uh, and before we knew it, within, I don't know what it was, was it within a year, we had massive protests, including on the streets of London with hundreds of thousands of people collectively declaring um, their, the importance of this issue. And that filtered through to government. So this is a slide of the EU Parliament um, voting to declare a, as Europe a climate emergency the day after the paper that I've been talking about earlier was published. And of course, the UK had done that considerably earlier. So that was in November uh, last year. And uh, the May, back in May last year, the UK had already declared the emergency. Great, declarations are good, but they have to be followed by action. So what we're really looking at here is a problem where all different actors, including nations, have tended to look at each other and go, well, I could do something, but if I do something in the, an X, where X could be any other nation, doesn't do something, then, um, then it doesn't count what I do. So we've been stuck in what um, people in a field called game theory call a prisoner's dilemma where it would be in all of our vested interests to act together to decisively avoid this climate emergency that's coming. But we fail to coordinate um, to avoid the emergency. However, there's a glint of hope because as some studies have shown, if we become sufficiently certain about the nature of the emergency and how damaging it will be, which is the uncertainty range on the x-axis here, we can narrow that uncertainty down then we should see uh, collective behavior tip into a completely different mode of operation where we desperately try to coordinate across uh, peoples and nations to avoid uh, what, what will otherwise be a catastrophe. So let's hope we're getting near that point. And for some other rays of hope, um, we need to look at the way that social and technological change unfolds anyway because it doesn't unfold what we call linearly. And here's a historical example where it's Easter Parade, Fifth Avenue in New York City in 1900, and everyone's in a horse-drawn carriage except one person in an automobile. 
ringed in red, but within 13 years, the situations inverted, the same day, the same city, the same street, the same parade, everyone's in an automobile except one person in a horse-drawn carriage. In other words, there, are, there have been and there will continue to be major tipping points of social technological change where we completely change our technology and our behavior patterns pretty quickly. And I believe one of those changes is underway right now. And Norway is like the leading light in this, thanks to some very intelligent government policy interventions, because the uptake of new electric vehicles in, Europe, in, in Norway now exceeds the uptake of petrol and diesel vehicles. And the policy that's achieved that is one that just made it at equal price at the point of purchase, essentially to buy an EV rather than a conventional fossil fuel powered vehicle. That's a policy that could easily be instigated more widely, for example, across Europe to tip that change on a larger scale. And with the, with the economies at scale that result as you expand electric vehicle sales and production, the price comes down anyway. And because there's a far less moving parts than an electric vehicle, ultimately it's robustly predicted that they should and will be cheaper than fossil fuel cars and trucks anyway. So that's one tipping point that's starting to happen and could happen more widely. A more profound one, if you like, is the way we power our whole societies. So this is my little summary of how the biosphere has been powering itself over time in blue and brown, and in green and black, how human societies have been powering themselves over time. Of course, we're still more than 80% dominated by fossil fuel energy, but the change is happening around us. The price of solar PV and wind power is cost competitive with fossil fuels across many nations now. And in the next decade, some of the projections say that uh, renewable electricity will undercut pence per kilowatt hour fossil fuel electricity by a factor of five. So a revolution in energy electricity supply, at least, is happening around us. And it will very soon be the case that not only does it make sense to put in new renewable capacity, but in a country like China, we're not far from the point where it will make sense to abandon an asset, an existing coal powered fire station and replace it with brand new renewables. So that's a tip. Well, that's a profound tipping point that I think is unfolding already. And in our nation, we've been ahead of the game because we've shut coal out of royalty. The government has succeeded in shutting coal out of UK power generation in, a, in the last decade. And they did that with a, adding a carbon tax on top of the baseline EU carbon price, and it was very effective. So it led to a big shut, of, shut out of coal from electricity production, shown as the precipitous drop in the black line here on the right, and the corresponding rise in the various renewables in green, blue, and yellow. And that, those tipping points, like all tipping points, have irreversible elements. So coal-powered fire stations in the UK have been being destroyed. This is Didcot Power Station in Oxfordshire, the cooling towers demolition in 2019, I think, from memory. You can't go back on a decision like that very quickly. So let me finish. Some climate tipping points have probably already been passed. And if we carry on what we're doing, I'm afraid others that should be expected. Uh, our current knowledge should be compelling action to limit global warming to well below two degrees C. And that translates in simple terms to, to putting a realistic price on carbon pollution of at least $100 per tonne of CO2, possibly quite a lot more, which would have radically changed our behavior if it was imposed uh, but my, perhaps my main point is, is that it's obvious what we need to do, but to achieve it at the rate we need to achieve it, well, we need to find the tipping points in society, and possibly in ourselves, to tip a you know, transformative change quick enough to avoid the worst. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Tim. That was really interesting. Um, and we've had a couple of questions come in, which is brilliant. But yeah, thank you. That was... Uh, very informative and some real food for thought. 
we were speaking earlier on just about the kind of political side and looking at COP26 coming ahead next, next year. What sort of focus is the team around COP26 having and how are, they, how are the themes that you've mentioned today being driven into the agenda of discussion for that? So the good news here is those examples I was finishing on of how there's been success with tipping points with electric vehicles in Norway and coal power being removed in the UK. I've been working on those examples with a member of the COP26 team in the cabinet office, Simon Sharp. Together we've actually been working on and putting a paper out on how, how we could tip those kind of changes to cascade to larger social and political scales. So the, the, the overarching message here, folks, is um, in the COP26 team, kind of thinking is, is key. And OK, COP26 has been delayed a year, but what the COP26 team are trying to achieve, with all of us, I hope, is to find these ways of accelerating action. And that also includes bringing the right coalitions of actors together to realize that we don't have to get everybody to agree on everything. We just need to find a group of jurisdictions, actors, nations, if you like, that have a shared vested interest to tip, tip positive change. And in the case of electric vehicles, it's pretty obvious that the EU, China and California have a shared vested interest in that transition. And in the case of shutting coal out of electricity, well, it's a rather more negatively motivated thing, but we're, we and the COP26 team are looking very hard at trying to break the triad of countries that still finance coal-powered power station development. Um, China, Japan, Korea. So it's those kind of actions that they're actively working on that I'm trying to support them in. And I think we can all apply this kind of thinking to get our, get ourselves out of trouble. <laughs> okay, interesting. So yeah, hopefully it will be a, a groundbreaking year moving forward. Um, looking at some of the kind of social attitudes and social responses, there's been a question about whether there historically have been examples of positive and sufficient social tipping points when faced with a calamity of similar magnitude. How, how historically have human populations responded? Well, we have to look into slightly different um, domains of human behaviour, and then we might debate at, at great length uh, how fast we tip changed. But when you go back to historical examples like the abolition of slavery, it unfolded pretty quickly, um, the abolition that is, against the backdrop of centuries of slave trading okay, we shouldn't have been doing it in the first place, and that seems transparently obvious to us in a modern perspective. Of course, we could counter that with examples of how slow progress has been um, in, the, in these human realms, but, but that's not, I mean, one, one, one could pick, one could look for signs of hope in other areas. There's the example of how we tackled the ozone hole, a slightly more environmental one. The, once it became blindingly obvious that there was an ozone hole and we already knew the gas is responsible for it, the coalition of industry and governance that sort of substituted CFCs for less damaging chemicals, with some caveats, was pretty fast to form and in fact was being not perfect but fairly effective at shutting down the cause of the problem. It still takes a long time for the ozone hole to seal heal and that's because of the, the irreversibility or hysteresis in the physics and chemistry that we're talking about. So they're not perfect examples and I have to confess that we have a bad track record as a species of where well, we get we get an early warning on a, of an impending environmental catastrophe but we fail to act until the catastrophe has happened. That's happened over and over again with fisheries collapse and so on. The point is we can't afford for the global climate catastrophe to happen before we decide to do something about it, because to put it bluntly, uh, we'll be dead by then, or at least our civilization will have collapsed and things will be highly unpleasant, in my view, personally. Okay, perfect, thank you. This is blunt, and I, I realize I'm a little blunt and direct, but I'm just telling you how I see it. Yeah, no, definitely. 
Um, so looking at along a similar theme then, when previously we've seen agreement amongst global um, players be fairly slow to occur, how do we get global agreement on an effective carbon price or, or subject? Yeah, so I think this is a crucial question, whoever's asking it, because what's happened with the climate problem is we've gone from a thing called the Kyoto Protocol, which was an eff effort to get a legally binding a universal or multilateral agreement, but it had was a very weak, it had very weak targets. We've gone from that to a, a unilateral non-binding situation with the Paris Agreement of intended nationally determined contributions, as they're called in the jargon. But that's no use either, frankly. I mean it's not because it's not it's not got legal teeth behind it. And it's at the complete other end of the spectrum. So you've got kind of, should we do, should we try to do multilateral action? That didn't work. Should we just leave it to non-binding unilateral action? That's not working. Well, to my mind, it's obvious we need to find somewhere in between. So we don't need to get everybody to agree on everything because that was kind of proved impossible by Kyoto. The key point though, that, that Simon Sharp, myself, the COP26 team and others are trying to point out is that in the middle ground is the possibility that coalitions of actors with a shared vested interest in all winning from doing something should just come together and realize that so by setting you know by by shared action which could well be a shared price on carbon um well several nations have got a vested interest in that if it was in the context of the electric vehicle revolution i've already mentioned who i think those actors or nations are so if they're all in a win-win situation then they need to come together and set strong binding obligatory targets together and trust each other to stick to them it would certainly help if we had something with as strong a legal teeth as the world trade organization imposing a carbon price globally though but i'm not gonna have, i'm not gonna hold out for that because i <laughs> i realize how difficult uh, it will be to get to that position and that's why instead I'm looking at these other ways of, of tipping change, even if we don't have that. Okay, interesting. So slightly more UK focused um, question. Do you have any comment on the new natural gas fired power plant, which is being built in the UK at present? What a pity. Um, <laughs> and on top of that, I'm even more worried about, well, several of us have signed a letter that will go to ministers today or tomorrow and will hopefully be in the press at the end of this week about these these supposed move to reinvigorate some coal mining in the north of our country uh, which, uh, which is, uh, the thought that the government would re-incentivize coal extraction is insane <laughs> uh, so yes I won't I won't say more but I think you can read my views on uh, the inadequacies of our current political elite Okay. Um, another view, just to say that biodiversity and ecosystems weren't explicitly mentioned in your uh, presentation as examples of tipping change. What is your view on the importance of addressing these? Uh, fundamental. I mean, I, I feel a little guilty because my true, my true kind of scientific um, calling was, was to work on the profound interconnection between life and the non-living planet and the fact that we're only here because past and present life forms have made a, a breathable atmosphere and a stable climate so for me other life forms are the most important thing for all of our survival and i could have chosen a more ecological example like the threat we pose to tipping the collapse of the amazon rainforest for example suffice to say that um, yeah, protecting our life support system, which is made up of other thing, other living things, principally bacteria, is absolutely fundamental. And we need our value systems to recognise that, which they obviously don't at the moment. But to monetize ecosystem services, to try to fit them into this neoliberal capitalist economy we live in, has its own dangers, because we all need to recognise that that our life support system, other living things are not substitutable in the language of economics. In other words, 
we shouldn't put them entirely into the marketplace because uh, nothing, no machine, no thing we could build could replace the, the, what they provide for us. They are our life support. So whilst I can understand why we're trying to use economic mechanisms of valuing ecosystem services, I believe all of us should be clear that um, they're more valuable and more important than, than, than any monetary uh, instruments or values we can put on them. And in fact, if we did our economics properly, we can account for that and we can, sh we can demonstrate the value and the danger of tipping the loss of of ecosystems and I've also done a study on that which I didn't choose to talk about today but it, it, it again would provide a compelling reason to pr preserve the living world as as the most valuable thing we have uh, we can't live without it yeah no, thank you that was a, that's a really nice point to end on I think and we've both run out of, of time so I think I'll leave that as the end of the questions if you're happy with that Thank you. Summed it up. Very really happy. Well. Thank you, everybody, for those great questions and for, for, for viewing this seminar or yeah. webinar. And thank you to you for presenting. It was really interesting, and hopefully that will engage some more discussion as this has been recorded and will put on YouTube. So, it'll be an opportunity for people to kind of continue the discussion and share the link.